welcome everyone to 60 Minutes in Space. I would like to introduce Dr. Kachun Yu. And while you're watching the program, please put any questions or comments in the chat. You won't see each other's chats, but I'll be keeping an eye on it and we'll have time at the end for questions. Um, and yeah, tonight we're also excited. This is our first time to have ASL interpretation, um, which is really great. <laughs> and all right, take it away, Dr. Kachun Yu. All right, thank you very much, uh, Mitch, and welcome everyone to 60 Minutes in Space. And as Mitch um, said, um, I'm going to talk about some of the biggest or bigger uh, news stories, and um, he hinted at um, what they might be. But um, <clears throat> what I want to um, start off um, talking about is um, a continuing story, a story uh, probably uh, the biggest um, for astronomers um, for the time being, in the sense that we'll be hearing about this telescope hopefully for many years, not decades to come. And this is an update about the um, James Webb um, Space Telescope. And um, I'm going to share my screen so that um, you can all see. <clears throat> and um, so um, a couple uh, months ago, um, back in February, I talked about um, the James Webb Space Telescope. And um, the month after that, we had a special guest uh, speaker, Jessica Libby Roberts. Um, who also um, talked a little bit about the continuing news on James Webb. And um, I'll, I'll talk about where um, JWST is now and what um, the, the scientists and engineers are currently doing with it. And so uh, as a reminder, um, the James Webb from Space Telescope is a telescope that allows us to peer um, further um, into the cosmos. And what that also means is um, also further back in time than our um, best um, space telescope currently up there, which is the Hubble Space Telescope. And so um, in this schematic, we have um, <clears throat> kind of the beginning of the universe off in the far right, and we're located on the far left of this image. And um, as we are looking um, out into the universe, because um, the speed of light is constant, um, the further away we look, the further back in time we're also looking. And so, uh, what um, JWST will allow us to do is to um, see the very first stars and uh, the very first galaxies that um, came into existence um, at the um, very, um, the, maybe perhaps the first 100 million years, um, between 50 and 100 million years after the Big Bang. And in order um, to do that, um, in order to see uh, fainter objects than Hubble, what uh, JWST really needs is a much larger mirror. And mirrors are important in astronomy and for telescopes because telescopes are basically light buckets. The larger the mirror that you have, the more light that you can collect. And so for a given length of observation, you can um, collect more light coming from that um, single object and, um, and detect it faster. And so um, for James Webb, the mirror is um, about six and a half meters across. So that um, compare that to Hubble, which only has a mirror um, that's um, just under two and a half meters across. And what that means is um, James Webb um, has um, a collecting area of about 25 uh, meters squared. And that's um, just over six times the collecting area of the Hubble Space Telescope. The other um, thing that um, helps um, when you have a larger mirror is that the larger the mirror, the smaller or the finer the detail that you can see. And so um, James Webb um, will be able to see um, finer detail as well. And um, <clears throat> um, of course, having a really big mirror um, means nothing. You can't actually launch it. And it turns out that there's no rocket that's big enough to launch a mirror that big. And so as a result, James Webb is designed um, so that it folds up um, when it's stored in the rocket and then it unfolds um, when it's out in space. <clears throat> now, the other key difference between Hubble and James Webb is that the Hubble Space Telescope um, looks primarily invisible or optical light. So this is the light that our eyes are sensitive to when you're looking around you, you're um, looking invisible uh, light wavelengths. Um, the Hubble Space Telescope also ventures into the ultraviolet or UV. And, um, and there's also an instrument um, on board that looks into the, the what we call the near infrared. Um, well, James Webb um, looks only in the infrared, um, covering what we call the near infrared to the mid infrared. So anywhere um, from um, 10 um, to um, tw 20 times or, um, 
50 times um, longer in wavelength than the light uh, that we see. And the reason why um, GWST looks in the infrared is that when you're looking at galaxies, um, a lot of um, the light from galaxies uh, comes in the visible or optical and also um, comes in the ultraviolet or UV. But when um, you're looking at a distant galaxy, what happens is the expansion of the universe actually stretches out that light. And so light that um, is normally being emitted in the visible or in the UV, it, um, the further away that galaxy is, the longer that light is stretched out. And so it gets stretched out into the red and then finally into the infrared for um, the, the galaxies that we're really interested, uh, that James Webb is really interested in, uh, that we're using JWST to look at. And so you need to be able to observe in the infrared um, to, to see this light. And then even for objects that are uh, close by, so they aren't far, far away at all, um, infrared light um, can allow us to peer through a lot of the molecular gas and dust and just the general muck uh, that can obscure or um, block the light from stars. And so on the left, you have a, um, a Hubble image of a star forming region. So this is a region with lots of molecular gas and clouds um, of gas and dust. And you can see all of the activity these young stars um, are creating um, in their active formation. And on the right image is the exact same field, um, but observed with the Spitzer Space Telescope. And if you look closely, you can identify some of the same, same stars between the two fields. But you'll notice that for the infrared image, you see far more stars. And that's just because the, these gas and dust clouds tend to be more transparent to the infrared. Now you can find, always find a gas cloud that's so dense that um, not even the infrared can go through. But for the most part, um, you can use the infrared to sort of unveil or remove um, that obscuration that hides the starlight. <clears throat> now, because um, GWST is um, observing in uh, the infrared, you need to keep the telescope as cool as possible. And that's just because um, pretty much everything um, around you, anything at room temperature emits infrared um, light. And so you don't want the instruments and the telescope itself to emit the same amount of light and the same type of light that you're trying to observe. And so um, what the engineers and design team came up with was a um, sun shield. And that's the silver um, um, sort of um, material that you see um, below the, the main telescope assembly. And, um, and that material uh, basically insulates um, the main telescope and its instruments from uh, the sun. And so uh, it turns out now um, this, uh, there are five layers of the special material called Kapton. And um, this is a very thin plastic-like film and it opens up um, when the telescope is deployed and it blocks um, the vast majority of the radiation. Here you can see uh, those five layers opening up. And um, so on the sunward side of the telescope, it's receiving about 200,000 watts of energy of, of light from the sun. But um, on the other side of the telescope, on the cold side, it's only getting about 0 0.02 watts. So that's how much energy is being blocked by this um, sun shield. And, um, and so effectively the telescope um, at least on the instrument and the side with the mirror, um, side that you want to keep protected um, from um, heat from the sun and even heat from the earth and the moon, um, that's all, um, <clears throat> you know, all that other telescope um, structure is only being exposed to the cold of space. It's effectively uh, insulated from uh, everything else nearby. And just to give you a sense of how big the telescope is, you know, uh, <clears throat> the reason why J JWST is so large is because of that sun shield. And uh, often um, times the metaphor that people use is that it's um, basically about the size of a tennis court. And so you can see just from the dimensions, it's slightly wider, but also slightly not as long as your um, standard um, tennis court. Now, <clears throat> because um, the mirrors uh, or the mirror um, on JWST uh, folds up and it unfolds once it's in orbit, you have to make sure that the mirror has the right shape um, when it's unfolded. And the reason why is that telescope mirrors are actually very carefully ground or engineered. And so here is a, um, a mirror that's spherical, meaning uh, the shape of the mirror matches 
a, a sphere or a ball. And if you um, reflected light and from, a, from a distant source, that light won't come to focus. You can see that those light rays um, all um, <clears throat> come um, close to your focus, but they don't all quite merge to the same point. Um, whereas if you have a mirror that's um, actually shaped onto a parabola, um, the, um, those distant light rays will come to an exact point of focus. And so any um, changes in the shape of the mirror can affect your focus. And that's actually what happened um, over 30 years ago with the launch of the Hubble Space Telescope. It was actually launched with a defect in the mirror. And so on the left is um, what a, a point source, a star looked like with the flaw in the original Hubble mirror. Actually that um, flaw is still there, but um, what they were able to do with the repair mission was to send up optics that corrected um, that flaw. So sort of like eyeglasses, you know, corrective lenses for, um, for the telescope. And so instead of, um, have, so normally you want all the starlight, a star um, appears as a single point of light, um, in a, even in, in the telescope. And so you want all that light to be as concentrated as possible coming from a single point of light. And on the left, before the correction, um, there's a lot of light in, in the center, but there's also a lot of light that's scattered around it. But after the corrective optics were installed on Hubble, um, they were able to bring um, that light, um, all, um, almost all of that light, um, into the center. And so Hubble is basically operating at um, is, uh, uh, perfectly as possible um, given um, the, the optics that it has. And uh, for James, uh, for JWST, um, as we saw, there are uh, individual mirror segments. Um, so um, JWST's main mirror um, consists of 18 <coughs> individual hexagonal mirrors. You can see that they're, um, they're all uh, pretty big on the order of about uh, four feet across and they're made up of um, beryllium, which um, um, doesn't um, shrink um, or change size um, um, when you change the temperature very much, um, which is something you, know, you want to have, um, a property that you want to have in the mirror. Um, the mirror, um, each of the mirror um, also has actuators or pistons um, behind them, and those are used to help adjust the mirror. And, uh, and the way that the, um, the mirrors um, are adjusted to make sure that the fo uh, focus of the telescope um, is perfect, um, the, the, uh, the engineer spent um, the last several months doing. And so what they did was they took a picture of a single star and because the mirrors weren't quite adjusted, um, the star um, image appeared in multiple locations. And uh, what they did was they jiggled each of the mirror to sort of figure out which of these star images corresponded to which mirror segment. And then after they um, identified um, which mirror was which point, they then uh, um, shifted each of the mirrors so that they could then reposition the um, images of the star into locations that um, sort of corresponded to the, um, where each of the mirrors um, were located. And so you can see them shifting, and then um, at the end, we'll have a pattern for each of these stars that correspond to um, each of those mirror segments. And now um, here comes the alignment, and there are a number of things that they can do um, to align. Um, first of all, there's um, a uh, alignment of these segment mirrors where um, they um, correct, um, um, they actually defocus using the secondary mirror and, um, and um, through a mathematical process, they can bring each of these uh, mirrors, uh, these segment mirrors closer into um, our focus. And then um, the next um, step is to um, stack all of these um, um, images um, together. So um, right now, each of these 18 mirrors is operating like a separate telescope. And so what you want is to uh, bring um, the light um, that's being reflected from each of these 18 mirrors um, all together. So it looks like you um, have one telescope operating. So here you can see um, the 18 mirrors being realigned and um, those individual uh, points of, of, of a star now come together into one point. Now, um, in, in actuality, it's not quite one point. Um, you'll see that there's still, um, if you look at it at a microscopic scale, at the scale of the wavelength of the light that you're observing, there are um, still some errors, meaning um, those peaks uh, are associated with the light from each of the telescopes. They're, they're not quite um, stacked together, but when you look at the image um, after the, this image stacking stuff, you know, it looks pretty good. Um, there are what are called diffraction spikes. These are um, just um, an artifact 
of how light bends um, around the structure of the telescope as it's being bounced around. And so there, there are a couple of final steps. One is um, called coarse phasing, where um, they measure pairs of mirrors. And uh, these mirrors, um, when, when they observe with them, they can actually reproduce a fringe pattern. It's this barbershop um, pole-like pattern that you see. And um, when they adjust the pistons, um, they can get that pattern to change. And so what they want to do is um, keep adjusting the pistons that uh, push against the telescopes. And then once you've optimized um, the level um, for each of those mirror segments, you can actually push um, those um, star images closer together. So you're basically um, getting them um, to, um, to focus, to come together more. And then there's one final phase called fine uh, phasing, where they continue uh, to do this um, using optical elements within the instruments. And again, um, they um, basically uh, push the, um, <clears throat> those um, peaks um, from the different uh, mirror segments together so that um, you can get all the light focused as tightly as possible. And then this is the, um, the first image that came out after all of the mirrors um, were aligned. And you um, basically have, you know, based on the measurements um, from the telescope, this is um, basically as perfect of a focus as you can get as um, is, is theoretically possible with this telescope. And um, <clears throat> so it's really amazing work, um, you know, having these 18 separate mirrors, you launch them into space, um, they're cooled in the vacuum of space um, to uh, temperatures just above absolute zero, and you can get the, uh, this mirror to uh, align so well. <clears throat> but um, all this alignment was done with only one camera, uh, what they call the near cam, or the near infrared camera. And um, <clears throat> so it turns out that JWST has four um, instruments total. Some of them are imagers, uh, near cam is, is a camera or, and takes pictures or uh, takes images. Uh, MIRI um, over off to the um, right is a mid infrared um, imager. So that also takes uh, pictures. Um, there are two uh, spectrographs which uh, spread out the light from distant objects and, and you can basically read the fingerprint of elements in that light. And um, <clears throat> so after um, focusing for near cam, the engineers then went on to focus uh, for the rest of the instrument. And then um, when they finally did that, this is the image that results uh, from it. And uh, so um, what um, JWST um, does is um, they basically pointed it uh, towards the Large Magellanic Clouds. Um, and, um, and each of these um, instruments looks at a slightly different part of the sky um, in that direction. But um, as you can see in the detail, uh, boxes um, where they zoom into a, a smaller portion of each of what um, the instruments see. Um, you see um, bright um, stars that have that same diffraction pattern, that same um, pattern from a point source um, with near perfect focus. And so we know that um, they, they've managed to focus um, all of the instruments um, um, really well. Now, <clears throat> I mentioned before that um, Cooling the telescope is really important. You want to keep the um, telescope as cold as possible so that uh, the telescope, the optics, the instruments themselves don't glow with the radiation that you're trying to detect because that would just swamp your detectors with unwanted noise. And so here is a plot showing the, um, how the various instruments have cooled down since uh, the telescope was launched um, in Christmas of last year. So the telescope has been in, in operation for um, just about six months. And um, <clears throat> these lines here are the near infrared instruments. And so these are the, um, the near cam instruments, either instruments that don't need to be cool as much. And so um, they can be um, just exposed to the cold of space and uh, they'll just cool uh, by themselves and they reach a temperature of just under 40 degrees Kelvin. And what that means is that this is just 40 degrees uh, Celsius above absolute zero. So um, absolute zero is the coldest temperature that you can possibly have. And uh, they're just about 40 degrees above it. Now this light blue line, the one that drops all the way to the bottom here, this is associated with MIRI. And MIRI is the, um, the, the mid infrared um, imager or the mid infrared um, camera. 
And in the uh, mid infrared, you need to cool the instrument to an even colder temperature than the near infrared, just because the mid infrared operates at longer wavelengths and it would suffer from um, even uh, the, the amount of heat uh, that um, wouldn't necessarily impact the near infrared instruments. And so the, the MIRI actually has a, uh, a cryo cooler, meaning um, a refrigerator that uses liquid helium. Um, so it operates sort of like your refrigerator does, um, where um, you know the refrigerator in your kitchen has a coolant, um, and there are pumps that, um, that that are used to cool your refrigerator and your freezer. And um, <clears throat> JWST has a much more advanced version of that. It uses liquid helium, and it's able to cool it all the way down to about seven degrees, or just below seven degrees um, above absolute zero. So um, that's the operating temperature, and that's a pretty amazing temperature to be able to cool at you. And uh, if you go to the JWST website, you can actually find a current um, uh, diagram or um, display, uh, sort of like a dashboard showing um, what the temperatures are. And even the plot that I showed um, in the previous slide, as well as um, this current slide, I um, grabbed um, yesterday, uh, May 24th, so you can actually go and find out what the current uh, temperature is for JWST. And so um, you can see that the warm side of JWST, the side that's facing the sun, it's um, up to about 90 degrees, 89 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and, uh, and cooler parts of it are maybe around 55 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. So these are basically you know, temperatures that we experience in Colorado or in Denver. I think we hit 90 um, just the other week or, or last week. But um, just on the other side of that sun shield, it drops down to minus 384 degrees and minus 393 um, degrees um, Fahrenheit. And, um, and so that shows you um, how much uh, <clears throat> of a difference that sun shield makes. And then over here at point number one, um, here the uh, temperature is minus 449 or six degrees Kelvin. So this is the temperature of MIRI, the mid infrared imager. And you can see that they've achieved um, the, the, again, they've achieved the temperature control for, for that instrument. Now, um, as I mentioned, um, GWST has four instruments, but um, those four instruments have all together 17 different observing modes. And so there are um, lots of different ways in which astronomers can observe with um, the cameras and with the special um, scopes. And I'm only going to talk about. Um, you know, since we only have limited amount of time, just um, one aspect of the near infrared spectroscope, or the near spec, um, and it's something called multi-object spectroscopy, and um, and I'll explain um, what that is. But um, near spec um, is um, one of two spectroscopes or spectrographs, and um, like I said, a spectrograph is basically um, an instrument that takes the light that's coming into a telescope and it spreads it out. Um, by its wavelength or, or its frequency. And when light is coming from stars or from distant galaxies or from gas and dust, imprinted upon that light is a fingerprint or a signature of the elements that make up the stars or the gas or the galaxy that you're observing. And so when you spread out the light, you can basically figure out the composition of very distant objects in the universe. Now, um, <clears throat> spectrographs or spectroscopes have been used by astronomers for um, many decades, um, um, over a hundred years. And um, they can be um, difficult um, to use in, in, play, uh, in parts of the sky. We have lots of crowded um, objects. So here is a part of the sky um, imaged by a ground-based telescope where you see lots of stars. And so if you, can, um, if you only want to observe um, certain stars and if you can somehow isolate them, then it would make your observations a lot easier. And so astronomers came up with a way to basically isolate the stars that they wanted to observe. And then each of those stars then give you these strips, uh, these horizontal strips. You can see the short vertical lines. The short vertical lines um, are basically the fingerprints of the elements that I was talking about, the special lines. Now, in the past, what astronomers had to do was if they observed a bunch of galaxies or a bunch of stars, they would have to go into the metal shop and create a big metal plate and punch holes in the plate where the positions of the stars of the galaxies were. And so here's one example of a telescope down in New Mexico 
where they, uh, they did this, and you can see how big the metal plate they had. And you can imagine how much effort it required um, to make this metal plate so that you can uh, gather light only from the galaxies that you want to observe. Um, but um, nowadays, uh, the, uh, the te technology has advanced quite a bit. And so instead of um, attaching fiber optics by hand to holes in the metal plate, now you can um, set up um, a, uh, a spectrograph uh, or a spectroscopic instrument so that um, there are robots that can actually put the fiber optics in the places where you want to observe. And so this um, camera called the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument um, is um, down at a telescope in South America. And uh, it um, covers a, a good fraction or a good portion of the sky. It actually covers about 30 times or 38 times uh, the size of the full moon. But what um, it can do is it can position um, those fiber optics to different parts of this um, coverage area. And then in addition to that main galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy, it can observe a um, galaxy that's in that's off to the side and, and give you the spectrum of um, that particular um, galaxy. And so for the near spec instrument on JWST, you can see that um, here is a uh, sort of a schematic of how the light travels and bounces around inside the spectrograph. But you can see that there's an instrument here called micro shutters. And what the micro shutters are, are, well, as the name suggests, they're um, little um, tiny windows or shutters that can open and close. And so um, uh, here's um, a picture of a grid of them. And here's a closer up of what the shutters um, look like when they're cl um, closed. And you can see that there's a little probe that's used to uh, prop one open. But um, there are four arrays of these uh, micro shutters and uh, each array has about 63,000 of them. And each of these shutters is much finer than a human hair. So uh, basically um, here is um, one of the arrays. And then here is um, each of those, uh, four of those arrays uh, put together into the light path inside the spectrograph in instrument. And so, um, so basically um, astronomers um, controlling uh, JWST can um, um, program the micro um, shutters to basically let in only the light that they want um, to see coming from specific um, galaxies or specific stars. And um, on ground tests, um, they're able to show that you know, this basically works. So each of these horizontal lines that you've seen come from um, a micro shutter that has been left open and, um, and the light that we're seeing is, um, um, I think coming from like an argon gas that they're using as uh, to, to test with in the lab. So uh, this is kind of an amazing technology that was developed for JWST that um, we'll be um, hearing more about in the future, but I just um, wanted to show you just um, how revolutionary some of the technical advancements um, have been uh, for the development of this telescope. Um, <clears throat> Currently, after they've um, focused, um, they're commissioning um, all these instruments, basically uh, making sure that they all work. Um, so I mentioned the 17 different instrument modes. So they're going through each of those modes, making sure that they work. Um, MIRI uh, um, had, um, was used to image um, parts of the sky um, and during its commissioning process. And um, NASA released um, the image on the right and this is um, a part of the Large Magellanic Cloud in the sky. And on the left is um, the same part of the sky is taken from the Spitzer Space Telescope. And um, Spitzer Space Telescope has a mirror that's um, just under a meter, 0 0.85 meters across, compared to the six and a half meters of JWST. And so um, and because JWST has the larger mirror, um, like I said earlier, the larger the mirror, the finer the detail that you can see. And so um, JWST has about seven times, seven and a half times uh, larger diameter. And so it's seeing detail seven and a half times finer than the, um, the last space telescope that we put up that um, observed in infrared. Here's um, yet another um, um, set of pictures. So again, JWST on the right and the same part of the sky. Um, with Spitzer, and you can see how much more detail we're seeing. 
uh, with the new um, space telescope. And then finally, I just want to end uh, my um, section on JWST, just talking about um, what kind of science is possible. And um, <clears throat> after um, the uh, engineers and scientists finish commissioning the telescopes, then they'll start taking some of the early um, release images. And uh, we might start um, hearing about the, uh, the latest images in just an, another couple months. But uh, over 200 um, different observing programs have been approved um, to, for observing, for observations this first year. And so I just want to mention just a handful of them. One of these has to do with observing the very first galaxies. And so you can imagine that we and our sun and our galaxy and JWST are off on this right-hand side of this diagram. And when it's looking, it's looking out into space. And it's also not only looking further um, out into space, but it's also looking back in time. And that's just because it takes time for light rays to travel to us for far in the universe to get all the way to us here. So when we look at distant galaxies that are perhaps, you know, in this case, 5.9 billion light years away, we're seeing them as they were 5.9 billion years in the past. And the most distant, um, well, actually this is 5.9 billion years after the Big Bang. So that's um, 8 billion years in the past. So the galaxies here are about 8 billion years um, in, in the past. And the galaxies way off here, um, the light took 13 billion years to travel to us. And so the light was emitted uh, 0.9 billion years after um, the beginning of the universe in the Big Bang. And so these galaxies that we're observing are much uh, younger, the less evolved than the galaxies um, off to the right here. And uh, so we're expecting to see younger, smaller, less massive galaxies um, off in the distance. And whereas the galaxies here are older and they're more massive just because they've had more time to evolve and to grow bigger. Here is a computer simulation of um, what JWST might see. So on the, um, the left is what Hubble saw in this region. And then this is a simulation of um, what um, the Hubble Space Telescope might see. So again, these galaxies are um, from the color scheme that we saw before, they're larger, they're, um, they're older, they're closer to us. Uh, but with JWC, not only can you still see the same galaxies, but you see also the much further away, the more uh, younger and the more distant uh, galaxies, these kind of the red and orangish and, and yellow um, dots. And then here's yet another um, simulation of what um, two different um, telescope campaigns with JWST might look like. And just um, seeing, you know, um, by observing to um, um, different depths, meaning different uh, lengths of exposures, you can have um, you can see lots of galaxies, but then if you observe even longer, you can even see fainter objects that this observing program doesn't see. Now we can look at distant galaxies, but we can also look at more um, close by objects um, like um, planets and stars that are forming inside of our own galaxy. Uh, this picture shows uh, protoplanetary disks. These are disks of material surrounding young stars. And so these disks contain um, gas and dust that will eventually form planets. And um, JWST can be used to image, and not only image, but also to, um, to take spectra, um, to look at the light, to spread it out, and to look for the chemical uh, fingerprints. And so a lot of the um, organic compounds, the molecules that um, eventually um, are important for the start of life here on Earth, we expect them uh, to be found in these disks. And so it turns out that um, by, with JWST, we might be able to observe um, compounds like methane and, and ammonia. And to not only to measure them, uh, but to find out the environments, to measure the environments that they're in, uh, the uh, temperatures of the gas, the densities and so forth. And so to allow us to understand how these disks evolve over time um, and to lead to the uh, to solar systems and planets um, <clears throat> that might um, come from them um, in, in the future. We can also look at um, planets that we find around other stars, um, the so-called extrasolar planets. And in this case, this um, planet um, called HD 80606b, it orbits a star in a highly elliptical orbit, meaning instead of having just a circular orbit, its orbit is stretched out. 
um, in, into an ellipse, sort of like a cigar shape. And uh, its orbit, um, the planet orbits in, uh, in about 111 days to go um, all the way around. But as you can see in this diagram, at one point in its orbit, it's much closer to the parent star than, much, uh, than the other part of its orbit. So it turns out that when it's closer um, in, um, it receives about 950 times more sunlight than um, when it's furthest away. And so what that means is that the temperature on this planet um, changes rapidly and uh, the weather on it uh, changes really quickly as well as it orbits, because it, um, it orbits in 111 days. It's whipping around and it comes back um, just over three months later, three of our months. And uh, depending on where um, JWST observes it, um, we'll see different phases or different amounts of the planet um, illuminated by the, 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 the sun, by its central star. And so as a result, we can observe it and then um, and see what happens to clouds. Um, they're expecting clouds to form and to dissipate really quickly. And so JWST will allow us to basically watch the weather on this um, distant planet. And then finally, um, just to talk about solar system science or science inside of our solar system, um, the moon Europa around uh, our planet Jupiter, um, we think it has a, um, an ocean underneath its surface. And uh, uh, that surface is an icy shell that could be tens of kilometers, if not a hundred kilometers thick. And so it'd be a long time in the future before we can drill through that shell to study the water that's underneath because you know it's impossible for us to drill through um, 100 kilometers of ice um, here on Earth, um, you know, and, and uh, not even um, talking about in, out in space. But um, there is evidence that Europa um, does expel plumes of water out into space through cracks in its shell. And so JWST has a program to look for those plumes and to look for some of the active geology where these plumes may be coming from. And uh, if it detects a plume, it can uh, put a, uh, a spectroscopic um, um, imager or a spectroscope on it. And again, um, it can um, use the spectroscope to detect um, compounds that uh, might come from interesting chemistry that's, uh, that's existing in the water um, underneath um, the European surface. All right, so with that, um, that's the end of um, my <coughs> talk about um, where JWST is, and um, you can expect in upcoming 60 Minutes in Space programs, we'll be um, talking about the latest um, images and results as they're released by NASA. And then um, finally, I want to um, just end on the, uh, the big news story that I think um, most uh, people um, might have heard about if you have any interest at all in astronomy, which is the uh, the black hole at the center of our Milky Way galaxy that was imaged. And so this is what's known as the Sagittarius A star black hole. Um, you can see, see the title of it. And uh, there's an asterisk and astronomers actually pronounce that asterisk as um, the word star. So you'll hear astronomers refer to this as Sag A star or Sagittarius A star, but it's the central um, supermassive black hole um, in our Milky Way galaxy. And this image comes on the heels um, uh, from three years ago. Um, you might remember that um, the same team, the same science team announced the imaging of the M87 black hole. So M87 is a, um, a large elliptical galaxy. It um, has about twice the mass of our uh, Milky Way, um, 10 times the um, number of stars in, in our Milky Way, uh, but it's also um, located about 54 million um, light years uh, away. And so um, it's um, a very massive um, galaxy, but it's also um, much further away, uh, but, um, uh, but it also turned out to be easier to observe as, as we'll see. And uh, so let's talk about um, Sag Sagittarius A star. And, uh, and to do that, I want to go back to the history of people trying to understand what is at the center of our Milky Way galaxy, because we've known for over a hundred years now that um, our Milky Way is sort of disc shaped and, uh, and the sun lies actually about halfway from the center of that disc. And um, in 1933, a, an engineer by the name of Carl Jansky, um, he was tasked by Bell Labs, um, the telephone company, 
to, uh, to identify um, static uh, because Bell Labs was interested in using um, radio um, for communications. And so they wanted to identify all the sources of radio static. And so Jansky built a radio antenna that rotated. You can see that it has wheels and those wheels run on a circular track in this picture. And he basically used that to, um, to map radio sources um, that were in his environment. And he found things like you know, thunderstorms, lightning um, and thunder would create radio hiss that could be detected. But um, whenever the antenna was swept over a certain part, part of the sky um, that included the constellation of Sagittarius, um, he noticed that there, uh, there was also this strong hiss. And so Jansky was basically the first radio astronomer and he's often called the first, um, the father of radio astronomy because of this antenna that he built. Now, um, fast forward to 1951, and there was this um, paper where um, the astronomers um, who authored this paper uh, finally um, localized um, this um, the, the radio source in Sagittarius to be basically coming from uh, the center of our galaxy. You can see in that highlighted text, a new discrete source of peculiar spectrum was discovered very close to the center of the galaxy. And uh, so that was um, almost 20 years after Jansky made his discovery. And then let's fast forward another 25 years, in 1974, when uh, two astronomers um, using um, a set of radio telescopes um, basically um, narrowed that radio source down to um, the inner um, light years, you know, a couple light years, uh, at the very center of the galaxy. And uh, that there are lots of stars at the center, but uh, even um, back then, astronomers started to wonder whether there might be a supermassive black hole at its center. And it took many decades and there are many thousands, you know, hundreds if not thousands of astronomers involved in making observations. But now um, we know that um, based on observations of star orbits around the center, uh, there appears to be a supermassive black hole about 4 million times more massive than our sun at the center of our Milky Way. And uh, two years ago, uh, in 2020, Reinhard Genzo and Andrea Ghez were two astronomers of, uh, of three people who were awarded the Nobel Prize in Phys Physics because their observations of the Galactic Center basically helped seal, you know, or um, help us understand that uh, there was something um, as massive um, as a supermassive black hole at its center. Now to uh, talk briefly about um, how black holes work, I need to talk about relativity and to talk about Albert Einstein. And uh, Einstein came up with his um, theory of special relativity in 1905 and his general relativity um, theory in 1913. And it's those theories that really describe the physics of black holes. And if you look at you know, the dates of when uh, Einstein lived, he was born in 1879, he realized that he came up with his theory of relativity, special relativity, when he was only 26 years old. And in that same year, he also wrote three other papers, which are landmark monumental papers in physics, including one that won him the Nobel Prize. He didn't actually win you know, the Nobel Prize for relativity, but it was another paper that came out that same year um, when, he, when he won the Nobel Prize. So we can tell how uh, a giant of a physicist um, Einstein was. But um, here's my um, two minute introduction to relativity, which I've, I've talked about quite a bit in my uh, past uh, presentations. But uh, what Einstein realized is that space, space and time really combined together. So oftentimes we think of space as being kind of like a venue or a theater where events can take place and time is sort of like the universe's way of uh, uh, keeping everything from happening all at once. But uh, Einstein realized that you can't really separate space and time. They're kind of uh, commingled co together into the three dimensions of space plus the one dimension of time is combined into what we call a four dimensional space time. Uh, the other um, aspect of nature that Einstein realized was that energy and matter are also insepar inseparable as well. We often think of energy and matter as being these two separate things, but um, you can actually convert matter and um, into energy and vice versa. And so Einstein came up with this very famous equation at the bottom. Um, many of you um, have probably seen it, even though you might not even know what it means, but it's basically um, showing how energy and matter uh, can be equivalent. And then the other um, really um, amazing 
realization that Einstein had was that space time and energy and matter can also affect each other. So they're, um, they're also not completely independent. Um, space time um, can be warped by energy or matter. And, um, and then um, the warpage or the shape of space time can affect how matter and energy move across space time. And so, um, so one way to, to um, explain this is that matter and energy tells space time how to curve and then curve space time tells um, matter and energy how to move. And oftentimes um, <clears throat> scientists will use this sort of distorted space time um, like um, as a way to show how gravity or mass from an object can, can, do, um, can distort space time. So here you have this grid, which normally would be flat if, um, if there wasn't an, an, a heavy object there or if there wasn't any mass there at all, you'd expect um, kind of like a flat uh, bed sheet. But as soon as you put something heavy there, that, uh, that bed sheet distorts and, um, and space time distorts. And as you um, have a more and more massive body, you can imagine that space-time distorting more and more so. So um, the picture on the upper left, whoops, um, let me go back, is uh, the distortion from uh, an object like the sun. And then if you um, have a very dense uh, compressed object like a white dwarf, it distorts space-time even more. And then if you have an object like a black hole, it can actually punch a hole through space-time. And so it can um, change um, space-time dramatically. Um, and the objects um, that uh, physicists um, realized um, just from the um, equations in general relativity, they um, were, um, could come up with objects um, that we know of today as black holes. And so, so black holes have a point in the center called a singularity where everything can disappear. There's also something known as an event horizon where lo even light can't escape. And so as a result, black holes look black because of that event horizon. And then um, there tends to be, you know, as stuff can fall in, um, they don't um, fall straight, straight in. They can actually orbit the black hole. And um, things can actually have stable orbits around black holes where they don't fall in at all. But as um, objects and gas orbit and heat up, um, you can get light emitted from that accretion disk. And so black holes um, can actually, or, or, or can be bright because of the light from the surrounding gas and dust. And then uh, this is another uh, sort of graphic showing how stuff can fall in uh, from a black hole past what we call the horizon, um, past that event horizon of no rate hook turn um, into that singularity. And one way to think about it is not just things falling in, but space time itself falling in and disappearing into the black hole. Uh, black holes were um, first discovered as uh, companions to stars. And so astronomers started to find um, small invisible uh, companions to, uh, to stars in binary pairs. And th that was some of the first observational evidence of, for black holes. But we also started to find evidence for black holes in the centers of other galaxies. And so uh, again, these, um, these much larger black holes at the centers of galaxies have accretion disks around them. Um, and as material piles up and jams up um, in these accretion disks, they can uh, create the energy that can Result in energetic jets shooting off. And so that's why we have jets coming off from these um, black holes, we have jets coming off from um, these galaxies. And so that's where the Event Horizon um, Telescope comes in. And, uh, and basically, the goals of the Event Horizon Telescope was to use telescopes to image um, the distant black holes in other galaxies as well as our own galaxy. And um, I'm going to speed through this, but basically, uh, the idea behind telescope resolution is that. Uh, the amount of detail that you can see depends on the wavelength of the light, or lambda here, and then the size of the telescope, or d here. And so the bigger the telescope, the smaller the detail. And, um, and it also turns out that you can take multiple telescopes and combine them together. And by combining them, instead of the diameter of the dish, you're taking the baseline, meaning the furthest distance between a pairs of telescopes. And so you can imagine if you have telescopes that are spread out by a very large distance, you have a very large number that you're dividing by, and that gives you a very small number, which is the amount of detail that's, that's observed. And so for the Event Horizon Telescope, what they did was they took telescopes that was spread out across, not just the United States, but um, across South America, and telescopes in Hawaii, in Spain, even um, one up in Greenland, 
and one in uh, the South Pole. And so they were basically creating the telescope the size of the Earth. And by combining the light from pairs of telescopes, they can um, then generate um, um, images. And, um, and the way they do that is, um, here is um, kind of a puzzle. And this is actually an image of, of, of a, a picture of something, but um, it's been transformed mathematically into, um, um, into individual um, frequencies or um, spatial frequencies. And um, so if you were to convert this back into a normal image, this is what that image would be like. And so um, basically um, <clears throat> what this shows is each of these pairs of telescopes, they are sensitive to a particular spatial scale. So something that's either small in size or large in size. And it turns out that if you have a pair of telescope that's far apart, it's going to be sensitive to, some, to a detail that's small in size, whereas a pair of telescopes that's uh, closer together will be sensitive to a larger bit of detail. And so uh, when you combine all those details together coming from these telescopes or um, mathematically, you can get a pattern like this. And so again, it doesn't really make um, much sense when you look at it mathematically, but then you can use mathematics to deconstruct this image and now you get this other picture, which is a picture of uh, our T-Rex in, in, in the museum. And so uh, with the Event Horizon Telescope, they're basically using different pairs of telescopes um, to get the, the data. And, um, and this is um, because they're looking at the Galactic Center, they can only look at um, certain pairs of telescopes can only look at the Galactic Center at the same time. And so you have to wait for the Earth to actually rotate into place to, uh, for all the telescopes to have coverage. And, um, and this map just shows you the different um, types of coverage and the different types of detail that are seen. And so it turns out that the larger the baseline, so the baselines that are out here that are for telescopes that are more spread apart, they, they can see the, the smaller amounts of detail. And the telescopes that are closer together, they see um, larger detail. And um, this is 50 micro arc seconds and 25 micro arc seconds corresponds to the amount of detail that we're seeing. And now I'm going to skip this slide. But um, what the astronomers had to do is they had to combine the, the observations from the different telescopes. And there was so much data that they couldn't use the internet to do it. They actually had to use um, what we normally associate with the slowest form of communication, which is shipping it, the hard drives. So normally shipping you know, things takes a long time. Uh, but here they had to ship literally tons of hard drives because that um, is how much data they had to take. And uh, um, this is a, actually a picture of the South Pole Telescope and shipping from the South Pole. And because um, you know, the South Pole is in um, winter um, between um, February and October, you can't actually fly in or out during those months. And uh, the observations were taken in April of 2017. And so they basically had to wait until later that year in order to fly your hard drives out and then here is uh, one place where the, um, all the hard drives are being uh, sent to. And um, you can see them being unloaded from the FedEx truck and then opening them up. And then you basically have literally um, a ton or tons of hard drives that were sent um, containing about five petabytes of data. And five petabytes is equivalent to about five million gigabytes. And um, if you wanted to, um, convert that to MP3s, there's you know, some music that you want to send to you that could be equivalent to 5,000 years of music. Well, um, let's, um, so they're able to combine all that data and get the um, telescopic images that you see. And um, the, the, the black hole image that you see um, does have a, a, a event horizon and it's this um, part of the black hole, but there's also a, an, a period, an area where photons can actually orbit, light rays can orbit infinitely forever. This is um, a stable orbit for photons. And so there's something called a photon sphere, which also emits light. There's also a region called the innermost stable orbit that's represented in blue. And so it turns out that if anything falls inside this blue orbit, which is about three of the, uh, the horizons um, in, in size, um, things, um, things with mass are not stable and they'll eventually fall in. Um, but it turns out that because um, 
light rays, you know, even um, near or outside of this stable um, photon sphere, they tend to um, eventually fall in because it's easier for light um, you know, to be reflected or to be perturbed to fall in to, than to come out. It turns out that the, uh, the black hole, even though the event horizon is about this small, the actual shadow that we see projected onto the sky is about two and a half times uh, this, the actual event horizon. So when we look at the picture of this black hole, um, we're seeing that projected shadow. So that's um, the actual event horizon is about two and a half times smaller than the shadow. Uh, but this donut shape and this of light that we're seeing is coming from the superheated gas that's in the accretion disk surrounding the black hole. Um, there's also some light coming from that photon sphere, the sphere where the light rays can orbit infinitely around. And then as far as what the three blobs are, it's um, still um, somewhat unclear, um, but um, it could be, um, these are real um, blobs around the black hole, but they could, could also be energy um, artifacts because it's um, it, uh, just because of the way that the, from the positioning of the telescopes and how uh, the telescope data is processed, it can actually introduce artifacts. And so um, those might not be real. And finally, I just wanna end with a comparison of the Sag A star Milky Way uh, black hole with the M87 um, um, black hole. And you notice that um, you see similar amounts of detail. The, uh, the rings are roughly about the same size. The disks of, of brightness, the, the donuts are roughly about the same size. Even though um, the, our Milky Way um, supermassive black hole is about 4 million solar masses. The M87 black hole is 6.5 billion solar masses. And uh, our Milky Way black hole is 27,000 light years. And this other one is about 54 million light years away. So what that means is that M87 is about 1,500 times more massive if you just compare the masses, uh, but it's also about 2,000 times further away. And so those two effects actually cancel each other out. And uh, what you get is that even though M87 is larger, it's also further away. And so you end up seeing roughly about the same amount of detail for both of these black holes. Even though one is closer, it's also a lot small, smaller. All right, so with that, we're um, coming close to eight o'clock. And I think um, you know, if people have to leave, they can um, check out, but um, I will be around to um, answer um, questions that people might have. All right, <clears throat> excellent. And we do actually have some questions already. And I'll just add that, um, I was confused before, but the next 60 Minutes in Space will be live and virtual at the same time. So you can join in uh, either in person or on your screen. All right, on to some questions. Does the James Webb Telescope use machine learning or any other artificial intelligence? Uh, for its operations, it doesn't use any machine learning or artificial intelligence. Also, although, um, you know, so for operating the James Webb Space Telescope, um, people on the ground basically send it commands to tell it where to point and to what instruments to use, how long to expose for, et cetera. And then once it fills up um, its onboard hard drives, it then uh, has to beam that information back uh, to Earth. And so for the most part, you know, there's nothing too complicated um, for those operations. But once you get the data to the ground and you have, uh, have it in the hands of the astronomers, then the astronomers can do all sorts of stuff with the data. And so if there are uh, certain machine learning tools or algorithms that they uh, can use to help them understand the data or to process the data, um, I can imagine them using it. But for operating and running uh, JWST to get the data back, there's no you know, special, um, nothing special that they have to do beyond ordinary computer programming. All right, cool. Um, and staying on James Webb for a moment, why do they use liquid hydrogen instead of liquid nitrogen? Uh, they actually use liquid helium. And it turns out liquid helium is the coldest um, gas that you can have. Um, I mean, um, helium um, is special in the sense that it never uh, freezes solid. It will always stay um, a liquid um, unless you get to all the way to absolute zero, in which you know, the at atoms basically stop mo moving. But absolute zero, you can't absolutely get to. It's sort of like the speed of light. It's this hard limit where you can get really close, but you can't um, get to. And so for um, 
to cool things down to about seven degrees or less than seven degrees above absolute zero, you need the coldest coolant that you can make, um, which is liquid helium. For liquid nitrogen, liquid nitrogen, I think, um, is liquid um, around, I actually can't remember, I, I think it's maybe around 77 degrees. I might have that wrong. I might be thinking of some, some, some other gas um, that's liquid at that temperature. But um, so liquid nitrogen is, um, is liquid at a much warmer temperature. And so you can't even use liquid nitrogen to cool the other instruments, um, the near infrared instruments, because they have to be cool to below 40 degrees um, above absolute zero. And so uh, liquid nitrogen is great for um, cooling things on earth, um, as long as you don't need to cool it to you know, temperatures close to absolute zero. Right. Very cool. Very cool. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah. <clears throat> so one more question about, well, not just one more, but another one about James Webb. Um, <clears throat> so if it's an infrared telescope only, how can it observe planets? Wouldn't the heat from a nearby star render the planet invisible? Yeah. So, um, you know, infrared light um, is emitted by uh, pretty much everything um, in the universe. Um, and uh, the colder an object is, the, uh, the more infrared light at longer wavelengths it, it emits. Um, and um, so, so, um, so you can get infrared light pollution uh, from, from, from pretty much everywhere, but a telescope you know, can observe um, certain parts of the sky. And so um, it can image in a way that um, if there is a very bright source, um, it can avoid um, having that source be in, in, in the picture. Um, and, um, and it turns out that, um, you know, the, the infrared light from a nearby planet uh, might actually be nearer than the infrared light coming from a distant star. It, um, it's all relative in the sense that a planet is closer. And so even though it's a lot cooler than a distant star, the amount of infrared light coming from that nearby planet um, might be actually be much brighter than that more distant star. Now, of course, our closest star, our sun, is the largest source of infrared light and infrared light pollution. And so there are um, strict limits. I mean, obviously um, that sun shield is set up so that the solar shield is, um, the, the sun shield is always between the main telescope and the sun. So if the telescope's here, you never want to turn the telescope so that any part of it is exposed to sunlight. Um, and so, um, and they're, um, they you know, basically uh, make sure that um, however they turn the telescope, they're never going to um, risk um, having any part of the telescope be exposed to sunlight and warming it up. All right, I remember <clears throat> last month we learned that's why they're probably not going to look at Venus uh, with the James Webb. So, okay, ready for an easy one? How well do we understand the physics of black holes and how well do the laws of general relativity hold up in black holes? <laughs> Well, I mean, so far um, we've observed outside of black holes. I mean, we um, haven't been able to observe inside of a black hole because currently we, um, you can't really do that uh, by definition. Uh, but um, everything that we've observed so far um, outside of black holes, how uh, black holes um, um, interact um, and how um, they collide, collide and create gravitational waves, uh, which we can also observe um, general relativity has held up spectacularly well. So it's a theory that explains black holes uh, very, very well. Um, we know that it's incomplete in the sense that it doesn't include quantum physics, uh, but, um, but as far as explaining black holes, um, general relativity does the job. All right, well, so what is happening in the middle? Happening in the middle of the of black, black hole? hole. Um, there, there are a lot of, um, so um, what uh, physicists can do is they can use general relativity and say, um, and tell you um, what we think is happening. Um, and, um, but um, right now, um, you know, we don't have the tools to, um, to confirm um, um, that. So, so for instance, you know, there are a lot of ideas about how black holes, you know, might be used um, to, um, to turn into wormholes um, to travel, you know, to, or to send information mm -hmm. to other parts of the universe. And, uh, and those are uh, basically using the laws of general relativity and um, sort of uh, taking them to an extreme to see, you know, what that tells you. And, um, and right now we can, 
you know, make a lot of theoretical predictions, uh, but so far, uh, I mean, unless we have um, kind of the right tools to investigate wormholes, um, we don't really know whether, you know, wormholes can really exist just yet. All right, cool. <clears throat> so my sci-fi novel is still credible. <laughs> um, so HD 80606B, you said takes 100 plus of our days for its year. How long is its day and how many of its days in a year? Actually, I um, don't quite know. I mean, uh, um, a lot of um, planets that orbit relatively close to their parent star. Um, and we found lots of planets um, that orbit stars um, much closer than Mercury orbits um, our sun. Um, and, uh, but um, because they orbit so close, what happens is they tend to um, have um, the, um, the, the rotation tidally locked. So just the same way that our moon is tidally locked to us so that we see the same face of the moon. And what that means is the moon is rotating. It's not, um, it hasn't stopped rotating, but the amount of rotation on its axis uh, has it rotating once um, every time that it goes around the earth. And so we think um, just um, from, again, from um, physics, uh, many of these planets will be tidally locked so that they will show the same face to um, the, their sun um, the whole time and the same face away from the sun. So one side will be baked by the sun and the other side will be frozen because it always faces out into space. But um, in this case, um, I haven't actually investigated um, the, the discovery papers for that particular um, planet. And so um, if, um, if the, um, so it might be that, um, but it's unlikely to, uh, to be tidally locked just because that weird orbit precludes it uh, from being um, tidally locked. If it was tidally locked before and um, an encounter with a, um, a rogue uh, planet caused it to uh, go into this weird, highly elli elliptical orbit, then um, whatever um, tidal rotation that it had, tidally locked rotation that it had, wouldn't apply um, in, in, in this um, new elliptical orbit. And uh, if the planet was captured, um, then uh, it might have you know, some, um, some arbitrary rotation before it was captured and, um, and, um, and it wouldn't necessarily correspond to, um, to anything with its year either. So uh, I'm guessing that um, whatever rotation that it has, um, you know, it's almost random relative to its year. And, um, and if it does have an atmosphere that might uh, make um, determining what its rotation is a little bit more difficult, but it may not be impossible. All right, so if it were tidally locked, the year and the day would be the same, right? But it's, uh, I'm guessing it's probably not. Got it. <laughs> so more data needed. <laughs> yeah. I, I kind of had to work it through in my head too, which is why it took so long for me to answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, where, okay. What are the data speeds coming from JWST and how long does it take for data to go to or from JWST? Well, um, I actually don't know what the data speeds are, um, uh, but it um, does have a high gain antenna. And so it's presumably is, um, you know, uh, relatively um, current, although um, GWST um, has been delayed for so long that um, I don't know, you know, what current um, data transfer rates really mean uh, for that technology. But uh, GWST is located in an orbit about a million miles away from the earth. It's actually always opposite the sun. Uh, from the Earth, so it's about four times further um, than it, uh, it than the Moon is uh, from the Earth. But um, because it's so far away, it, um, and its orbit uh, around the Sun, uh, it has it set up so that it's actually never in Earth's shadow. And what that means is that um, JWST can always have its antenna pointed back at the Earth. And so, um, so what, um, what that also means is that, and uh, um, I don't actually know, but um, it, it does mean that. Yeah, it can uh, potentially have um, dedicated, you know, electronics um, that's just used for sending data back. And so um, it might uh, be very efficient at sending big data back, but I um, don't quite know the details. All right, cool. Now, could data collected from James Webb be fed into artificial intelligence simulations and environments and recreate what we might find on various planets? Well, um, it depends on the types of data that you're collecting. Um, I think, um, and, and, and I guess um, 
yeah, I, um, I, I don't think I have an answer, unfortunately, for um, the, the viewer, uh, <laughs> just because, um, you know, that type of work isn't something that I do myself. So I'm not familiar with what types of machine learning um, tools. I, I know it has been used. Um, I mean, part of the problem with machine learning is that uh, you need to train uh, your machine learning algorithm on existing data. And so you need to define what that data is and um, in what you're hoping to find in data that it's not trained on. And so without a more concrete example, um, you know, um, for um, looking at other planets, um, I'm not sure um, what the use case scenario or what example I could provide, but yeah, I'm sure there, there might be um, something, but um, not being knowledgeable enough um, for that particular field, I, I don't think I can come up with an example. All right, and then we have one final question. What is the best leading theory to understanding the laws of physics in the universe? Supersymmetry, multiverse theory, string theory? <laughs> Uh, it could be none of the uh, above. Um, so uh, right now, um, you know, like, like I said er earlier, I mentioned that general relativity um, does a really excellent job of explaining all the observations that we have of how things move at large scales. But we know it's incomplete because we know that quantum physics does an extraordinarily good job of explaining phenomena at very small scales, at the scale of atoms and you know things smaller than atoms, and um, and we also know that um, the two theories are incompatible with each, each other. The mathematics are actually incompatible. You can't take the mathematics of one and try to apply it um, and have it work perfectly with, with the other. And, um, and even, um, you know, in, part of the problem with understanding black holes is that, you know, in general relativity, <clears throat> black holes at the very center, you basically have a singularity, meaning a point that's infinitely small. You know, where it, things can um, contract um, and fall down to infinitely small, infinitely um, high temperatures, infinitely high uh, pressures. But um, those types of infinities don't exist in quantum mechanics. Um, so you don't have infinitely small singularities. And so even the description of black holes, you think ultimately is incomplete if you just base it on general relativity because it, um, it doesn't fully include quantum mechanics. And so there have been a lot of theories that have been advanced. Um, you've heard of um, <clears throat> string theory, supersymmetry is uh, like a variant of um, st string theory that have been um, advanced by physicists over the last uh, 40, 50 years. And, um, and so far, um, none has kind of risen to the equation where it seems like, oh yeah, that's a theory that we should be looking at really closely. So right now, um, you know, we have two really good physics theories that describe things at really small scales uh, for quantum mechanics and things at really large scales and uh, for uh, things that have lots of gravity uh, in the case of general relativity. But um, we don't have a theory of everything that does a good job of encompassing both quantum physics and general relativity. And there have been lots of attempts with string theory and you know, with all these different variations. Uh, but so far, um, no one has come up with a really convincing case that um, convinces everyone else. Um, unlike you know, what Einstein did a hundred years ago, where um, he was able to convince people pretty quickly that his um, theories um, were uh, correct um, after you know, maybe um, waiting a, a decade for um, the right observations. All right, and rest assured, once physicists figure out the full nature of physics, we'll talk about it here on 60 Minutes in Space. So uh, join us then <laughs> at some undetermined time in the future. All right, well, I think that's about the end of our program. Thank you everyone for joining us. I hope you'll come either virtually or in person to June 29th, the next 60 Minutes in Space. And yeah, everyone have a wonderful evening. Good night, everyone. <laughs>